This across the road is Hollis Street Hospital, Maternity Hospital. And I thought what better place to start my walk than the place where I first entered the world, where my energy first came into the world. Head good, body good, feet good, mind good, all good. Let's go. So this house on the corner over here was where Oscar Wilde grew up in the second half of the 18th century. Oscar Wilde was a world famous playwright and poet and he was said to be the first ever celebrity in the world. Celebrity in the modern sense of the word. And that was because he was very flamboyant, very outspoken, very controversial with his ways of thinking and talking. And the thing I loved about him was that he was a non-conformist. So he didn't just go along with everyone else's thinking and he came up with very unique ideas and thoughts, poems, etc. I very much liked my job at the time, I was very good at it and I saw my future in this here place but after my parents passed away which was around 15 years ago now or more than that I totally lost interest in my career and essentially began asking myself is this the meaningful type of work I want to be doing with the rest of my life perhaps I should be looking further afield than the desk in the window up here This is Patrick Kavanagh, a very famous poet to come out of Ireland. His work, his words, his poetry was said to have a transformative effect on culture. And one of the poems he wrote was about this exact spot where I'm sitting now, it's called Grand Canal Walk. But another of his probably more famous pieces of work was called Raglan Road. And this poem was then turned into a very famous song. Raglan Road is a poem about Patrick's doomed infatuation with a girl by the name of Hilda Moriarty. So this is the road where Patrick Kavanagh first laid his eyes on Hilda Moriarty. And Hilda was the inspiration for his poem, Raglan Road. And for anyone that knows the song, if you try this right now, try to recite the words without singing it, it's very difficult, which means I'm gonna have to sing it for you. So it goes like this, or something like this. On Raglan Road of an autumn day, I saw her first and knew that her dark hair would weave a snare that I might one day rue. I saw the danger and I passed along the enchanted way and I said let grief be a fallen leaf at the dawning of the day. At the beginning of a journey like this, you might have some idea of what to expect or things that might happen along the way, but you can only know so much. And this creates fear, uncertainty, and doubt. 
And this is why, as I step out of my comfort zone and feel vulnerable, I've got to try and focus and have blind faith in all the things that can go right. I am having oats, porridge and a banana. And second breakfast we will have on down the trail. Because I am a hobbit, I have a second breakfast. Excuse me. Got the Lawrence of Arabia going on here. So I'm just above Loch Tay, also known as the Guinness Lake, because it's set right next to a private property owned by the Guinness family, just down there. Just off in the distance here, a short way. Beyond the trees there's a river and a bridge going over it and the bridge featured at the beginning of the movie P.S. I Love You for anyone that's watched that movie. This here though, not best known for the movie or the Guinness family, best known for the land. This it kind of resembles a beehive hut, which would have been like the huts that the monks lived in way out in the west of Ireland or on Skellig Michael back in the day. And this is a dry stone building, so you can see there's no cement, there's no mud, nothing's holding these stones in place. They've just been carefully arranged so that it builds and holds the perfect structure that can withstand the elements. This is St. Kevin's monastic site in Glendalough in the middle of the Wicklow Mountains, an ancient monastery founded by St. Kevin. Once you enter within the boundaries of this monastic site, back in the day you are said to be under the protection of the monastery, be that because you have troubles, be that because you are lost, be that because you are even on the run. Once you come inside the boundaries of the monastery, you are protected.
I talked about protection. There were a couple of years recently where I lost my way and a lot of self-confidence. And I was attracting emo my emotional biases during that time too. So I was experiencing a lot of bad luck. I was experiencing a lot of unwanted feelings, unwanted situations. But after sitting through that and sitting with that for long enough, I felt it was time to take action. But I was very anxious about taking the action. And so the night before I began the walk in Dublin city centre, I went inside Whitefriar Church and I asked for protection. The ancient Celts, this is going back a long, long time, they used to build roads made of wood, so something similar to a railway track. And they would use these, ro these wooden roads to transport their chariots around. And there was one that actually was discovered in the bog up in Corley Bog up in County Longford. I was up there before, but I didn't see this piece of roadway. I'd love to go back up there and see it. And this, was preserved in the bog that's how it survived until today but those were the original roads that were built in Ireland and I'm sure they were all around here too they just disintegrated over time or else they are still here and buried beneath the earth small village called Glenmore not to be confused with Glen Row it's the old post office there it's a shame that these are closing down in the countryside I've lived in the countryside for a while as you may know and like a, a lot of the locals in their later years when they've retired they look forward to coming down the post office to pick up their pension or just to go down and have a little chat with someone and send off their letter and that's just been removed completely now that opportunity and it, it changes the social fabric of these towns in the same way as if the pubs were to disappear or the cafes you know See you now. I said see you now, but sure. We didn't even say hello. <laughs> that was the postman. So we'll hang on here for a few minutes, will we? We will. I don't know anything about bridges or construction of bridges but I know that that looks fairly spectacular as far as bridges go. Just on my right hand side is Flahaven's factory which is where they make the porridge, the oats which are famous and used all over Ireland. Originally built I think in the 1800s operated by the Dunn family then the Kersey family and now by the Flahaven family.
just as I, I was walking in to the tunnel it doesn't look real what you're, it looks like you're walking in a in a computer game almost and honestly it felt a bit like a horror movie it just felt like I should not be walking in here this is incredible I don't quite know how to feel about this though or to explain it because it is it is quite spooky you can see on the side these arches this is brick but in between this is the rock that it's all cut out of and it's soaking wet that's where all the water's coming from up above it's just the water coming down through the rocks this is very cold and soaking wet and it's obviously cold in the tunnel itself as I walk along here coming to the other end of the tunnel and even now that up ahead looks like it looks like a gateway to another world I'm not just saying this if you ever walk this tunnel you'll know what I mean it's like up ahead there is Narnia or perhaps Tirnanog the land of eternal youth What a spot. I slept from 8 p.m. or around 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Got up to see this and packed down the tent and now I'm gonna get walking. All is good now. Had a bit of anxiety filling up last night looking for a camp spot and I was tired from a long day of walking and that can add to the anxiety. And that's part of the trip too, it can happen but I think I've slept it off. The last couple of days were challenging, walking in the rain. I wouldn't say they were un unbearable, but they were uncomfortable to a point. But I sometimes feel like those days are like the glue that hold the trip together. You can't have a trip like this without those days without the wet, without the cold, without feeling anxious as I did a couple of days ago. And you just have to get on with it, you have to learn to embrace it. And I feel like I did a good job of that yesterday. I kept talking to myself all day as I often do, saying things like, half joking, well done young man. <laughs> sure, what else would you be doing? And whatever works for you, works for you, right? That yesterday was what worked for me. This here is Cove, a seaside town in Cork in the south of Ireland. Very, very famous for a maritime history. So the very first yacht club in the world was established here in Cove. The very first steamship to cross the Atlantic Ocean departed from here in Cove. And Cove was also the departure point for 123 people who would be boarding the Titanic back in 1912. The Titanic on the 11th of April put down anchor out at Roaches Point in the distance there and sent two tenders, two smaller boats, the Ireland and the America, to pick up 123 people at the pier just in front of me now. This is the White Star Line building. This is where the passengers of the Titanic would have handed in their tickets and walked to the wooden pier in front of me now. This is the exact same original wooden pier that was here, not only for the Titanic passengers, but all the Irish that would have left Ireland in search of a better life in America down through the years. They would have gathered together in this courtyard here 
and just up above on the platform is where the first class passengers would have waited looking down on everyone there are some very iconic photographs of this scene it wasn't just the passengers of the Titanic that left from Cove and never returned all of the migrants that would have left Ireland down through the years who got on ships here in Cove to cross the ocean to the America in search of a better life, a different life, a new life they would have also stood on the same platform down here, the same wooden pier as the passengers of the Titanic. Annie Moore and her brothers Anthony and Philip embarked from Cove on the 20th of December 1891 on the SS Nevada. Annie was the first person to be admitted to the United States of America through the new immigration center on Ellis Island in New York and that happened on the 1st of January 1892. Titanic was of course made into a blockbuster movie by James Cameron but what is it about Titanic that is so captivating that we still obsess over this story to this day and well first of all the ship was the grandest of its kind and of its time but I think the story itself all the hopes and dreams that were on this pier back in the day all the fortune that they felt lied ahead of them and none of it was to be and it would all sink to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. It is the ultimate story, the ultimate tragedy, or if you like, the ultimate love story gone wrong. I went into the White Star Line building yesterday. There is a small exhibit, a retelling of the story of the Titanic and the passengers who got on board here in Cove. When you arrive you're given a ticket and on that ticket is the name of one of the passengers. In my case I had John Kennedy and at the end of your time in the White Star Line building you get to see whether or not you survived the journey because the vast majority of those who boarded the Titanic here would perish in the icy Atlantic Ocean. Believe it or not John Kennedy survived and went on to live a life that nobody seems to know anything about in America. There was definitely a point of surrender in this trip when if you like the trip began to take me instead of the other way around and I say this not only because I ended up in places I never expected to go but because I felt particularly drawn to iconic people of our past such as Michael Collins, St Finbar and Tom Crean. Looking back I think this happened because in my eyes these were courageous people who embodied everything and stood for everything which made Ireland such a great country in the past. As I walk out of Cork City and along the River Lee, on the other side you can see all these big historic very expensive looking buildings and just beyond there is Shanakiel and what was once Shanakiel Hospital after the Irish leader Michael Collins was shot dead he was brought by his men to Shanakiel Hospital by which time he was long dead but this would have been the place where his body was kept overnight.
The ambush site is just up ahead. I believe this is the laneway that the soldiers who ambushed Michael Collins' con convoy travelled up. So I think they went up this laneway and they were eventually shooting down at the convoy from the high road. This here is Bailna Blaw in West Cork and the very spot where Michael Collins, the Irish leader, was shot and killed on August 22, 1922. There's a cross up here, but also a white pillar with a black cross here. And I believe, I think, this is the very spot where Collins took his last breath. Michael Collins was traveling around West Cork at the time on this day, inspecting the many garrisons, I think in McCroom, Bandon, Clonakilty. And as he was traveling through this area here, Bailna Blaw, he was ambushed, his convoy was ambushed by anti-treaty men. Collins knew this was a stronghold for the opposition, all this area. He also knew some of the most high profile and most experienced members were in this area. And in spite of that, he still traveled through on a very, with a very small convoy. There was a motorbike scout at the front. There was a tender with soldiers behind that. Then there was the Leyland or Leyland with Michael Collins sitting in the back with his right hand man Dalton and an armored car coming up the rear. When they were first ambushed, Dalton said to the driver, drive like hell. And Michael Collins apparently said, apparently said, no, stop, we'll get out and fight them. And they began to exchange fire with the anti-treaty men. So the convoy was down here. Eventually the anti-treaty men moved up to the high road here. They exchanged fire for around 20 minutes. And at one point the members began running down the road. Collins saw this, said to his men, look lads, they're on the run. He stepped out from behind the armored car and he was shot in the side of the head and killed. Imagined or not, the more I visited the churches, the ruins or the ancient sites during this walk, the more I could sense a connection. And this connection felt real, real as whatever I could see in front of my eyes. And nowadays, I think it's hard to even consider this type of spiritual connection, if it was that, because we have built so many layers on top of what we used to know in the modern world. And in a way, we filled our lives with so much junk and so much distraction that we, that we are far removed from what might allow us to have this type of connection. It says Kilhassen was the site of a church and ancient burial ground with uninscribed grave markers from 1680. Two hours of about 10 kilometers left. I'm so lucky I have this. I need this to get through the next two hours. <laughs> I love the names of the bands. There's Ohio Hill Music Festival. That's tonight, isn't it? The thirties. Anyway, the, the bands: Celtic Knights, okay, Flake the Gander, <laughs> Simple Things, and Bog the Donkey. <laughs> Wristbands on sale, twenty euro. I bet you there's DVDs as well. Okay, this is a mass rock. So during penal times. 
when everything was banned, our ancestors would have come here to attend mass. It also has here on Gortha Moor, this was the famine. The population was nearly halved in Ireland. One million died, one million emigrated, and one million remained to struggle on. So this is actually dedicated to everyone who died or emigrated during the Great Famine. Something up ahead. I was expecting some type of long red haired <laughs> ancient goddess to be sitting on the horse. And it was a quite a large farmer. <laughs> I was in Thailand all last year and I used to hike up to the temples first thing in the morning at around 5 or 6 a.m. and people used to often say to me I wish we had places like this back home where we could go and just sit and be quiet and think about stuff <laughs> we do <laughs> Lord, may this candle be a light for you to enlighten me in my difficulties and decisions. May it be a fire for you to burn out of me all pride, selfishness and impurity. May it be a flame for you to bring warmth into my heart towards my family, my neighbours and all those who meet me. Through the prayers of Mary, Virgin and Mother, I place in your care those I come to remember. I cannot stay long here with you in your church. In leaving this candle, I wish to give you something of myself. Help me to continue my prayer into everything I do this day. So this is Top of the Rock near Drimalig. And in the 6th century, St. Finbar travelled all the way here to Drimma League to deliver a sermon before heading back over the hills to Guggenbarra to his island hermitage and there is a path between here and there called St Finbar's path and that's what I will be following today. St Finbar was probably the most inspiring part of the walk. I often felt as though during that part of the trip I was being watched or watched over and I said in the video that the oratory on the island in Guggenbarra was where St. Finbar would commune with God way back when. And during this pilgrimage of my own, I sometimes felt as though I was communing with St. Finbar. This is the island hermitage on which St. Finbar lived in the 6th century and just before me is a rebuild of the oratory. This would have been the place where St. Finbar went to commune with God and then just here are the ruins of the monastery. And people from all over the country would come to spend time here to learn from St. Finbar, from the scriptures and from his godly ways. 
Humility is the door to learning. To learn is to admit we don't know everything. Learning doesn't just take place in the classroom. We are always learning. Finbar was a learner and he gathered around him a large number of men and women who were learners too. They learned from his life, but they also learned from his words, the story of the gospel. And this, as I said, is the place where Finbar would commune with God. And just before I leave here now, I'm going to light a candle. My mum died when I was 23 and my dad a couple of years later and I think when you lose somebody like that you have two ways you can go. I turned to self-destruction and self-pity in the years that followed but I eventually exhausted myself physically and mentally to the point where I had to consider that I might be going the wrong way. And it's not an easy thing to accept that you are wrong or at fault or that you are fully responsible for most of the things that happen in life but in turning around and going in the other direction I was giving myself permission to reinvent myself and to reinvent the life that I wanted to have. In the middle of the night, I go walking in my sleep Through the valley of love, through the river so deep And I've been searching for something <laughs> Hello you! I met a really interesting lady down in Kenmare yesterday Her name was Bettina from Germany but living in Ireland most of her life and she tells me she's 50 years of age she asked me why I was doing my walk she, she asked if she could know what the purpose of my walk is because I told her I'd been walking for a couple of weeks and that's all I said at the time and I said yeah sure and I gave her some very honest answers and afterward she said to me thank you and explained how even though she does a very meaningful job she takes care of elderly people in an elderly home a home for the sick and the dying in fact she said even though she finds the job very meaningful she herself at times feels there is an emptiness that needs to be addressed and i suppose a loneliness she has no family and she is searching for something one of the things Bettina said to me about her job is that it's often about listening to people in the home, people who are perhaps dying and helping to make them feel comfortable. She said one of the hardest things about that is she often witnesses or senses a sadness, a regret if you like. And this has caused her to think about her own life and to ask herself questions 
I suppose along the lines of, am I really doing all I can do with my time now? Am I doing the things I want to do right now? And if not, when am I going to do them? And I could relate to that. When my parents passed away, I was 23 and 25. And in the months that followed, I was asking myself questions along those lines. And questions which were even more vague, such as, what's all this life about? And I said to Bettina yesterday, someone once said to me to make sure I sing my song and to make sure I don't die with my song inside of me. Tom Crean was part of three of four major expeditions into the Antarctica and this was back at the beginning of the 20th century. The three expeditions he was part of were called the Discovery Expedition, Terra Nova and Endurance. These were very famous expeditions and they were led by very famous men, namely Captain Scott and Ernest Shackleton. The thing is Everyone knows about Scott and Shackleton, but not so much Tom Crean. Tom Crean was born just outside Anaskal in 1877. He was said to be a rather skinny, scrawny boy and the middle son of a large family of 10. His education was minimal and at the age of 15 he did what thousands of young Irish did. He enlisted in the Royal Navy and he worked his way up in the Navy. He spent eight years working as what's called a blue jacket. But it was just a job to Crean. And with three meals a day and the opportunity to travel the world, it was an exciting job to have at that time. He worked on many ships throughout his time in the Navy and in 1901 he happened to be stationed in the Pacific Fleet when Britain was sending the first exploration ships to the interior of the Antarctic. This expedition was being led by Captain Robert Falcon Scott and while getting ready to depart one of Scott's sailors attacked an officer and ended up running away. Captain Scott was now a man short and the first volunteer to throw up his hand to replace him was that of Tom Crean. During this so-called discovery expedition, Tom Crean stood out as an extremely strong and dependable man. I mean he really stood out amongst the many and so much so that after the expedition, Captain Scott took a year off to write a book. And when he returned for his next expedition, one of the first men he recruited was Tom Crean as a petty officer. They were never apart from this moment on and until Captain Scott famously died at the South Pole in 1912. He also served alongside Ernest Shackleton and he's the only man to have served alongside both Scott and Shackleton who did not like each other. There were books and films made by these captains or organized by these captains which funded the expeditions and this is largely why everyone knows about Captain Scott and Ernest Shackleton but not so much Tom Crean. It says, Tom Crean, Antarctic explorer, died 27th of July, 1938. 
his wife Ellen passed away January 1968 and their daughter Katie died when she was very young they buried her here in 1924 and then the rest of the Korean family extended family are buried here it says at the bottom rest in peace home is the sailor home from the sea In 1927, Tom Crean returned here to Anaskal and purchased this building and opened the South Pole pub. He lived here with his wife Ellen Herlihy and their three daughters and he ran this pub for the next decade until he passed away. He died due to a burst appendix which, although is a serious condition, is a relatively routine operation to fix nowadays. So very sad that he would die in this way having pushed through so much hardship and struggles. I arrived in Anaskal after a day of walking and listening to a podcast by Michael Smith, the author of Unsung Hero, the story of Tom Crean. And I say a funny thing happened because when I arrived, I sat down in the South Pole pub and instantly recognized the English voice across from me. I'm not sure where he lives, but sitting across from me was the author of that book, Michael Smith. And the way that Michael Smith describes Tom Crean is as a courageous man. The kind of man you want on your side in the midst of a struggle. The difference between life and death. And a great example, a shining example, of the fact that even a tiny, scrawny, skinny boy with little to no education can achieve greatness and live the kind of life that will never die because these are the kinds of stories that will live on in the hearts and the minds of people in Ireland forever. My dad used to call me baby when I was in an adult, not just when I was younger, when I was 20 years of age, 21, he'd say, all right, baby, let's go. He'd always encourage me. When he, when he watched me play football, he'd tell me, you always play better in the rain. And psychologically, that worked, because I always did. I always played better in the rain, especially after he'd said that. <laughs> The past 10 years of my life have been wild, to say the least. And there have been many times when I thought I had things figured out and just as many setbacks which made me think otherwise. This is why I've always needed to encourage myself. But what I have also learned is that I need help and that I often need somebody else to tell me what I think I already know. 
<laughs> Two greyhounds. Hello. Come. I went into the stole this morning. It wasn't planned, it was quite a detour in fact, but I wanted to sit down somewhere and have something to eat. And I'm so glad I went in there because when I was in Super Value, one of the staff came skipping down the aisle, went past me and as she did, she went, oh, hello, Derek. <laughs> and she slapped me on the arm, which I thought was quite hilarious. And then she said, I watch your videos. And I said thank you and I went on my way and it was a lovely interaction but just after that I was about to pay for my shopping, my lunch at the checkout and this same lady, her name is Kay, walked up to me and insisted she pay for my shopping. Which was obviously the loveliest thing but the thing that really got me, got me was that she hugged me and she said something along the lines of I hope you get your good I hope you get your head good again soon. And that was really touching. My favourite teacher, John O'Donoghue, used to say all the time that the greatest gift you can ever give another person is the gift of encouragement. And I think unfortunately it's very rare these days for that to happen. So to receive this from someone I had never met before. It was immense. <laughs> Hello. Bye. Brendan Kennelly was one of the most famous poets to come out of Ireland. He passed away a couple of years ago. He was actually born not far from here in a small town called Bally Longford. And I'm told that there's a memorial of some kind for Brendan Kennelly here on Carrick Island. And that's where I'm walking right now. It says here, Names of martyrs never die. O'Scanlan, Hanrahan, O'Shea, every meadow in the island gives a good crop of hay. And then over here, B. Kennelly, island man. Begin again to the summoning birds, to the sight of the light at the window. Begin to the roar of morning traffic all along Pembroke Road. Every beginning is a promise, born in light and dying in dark. Determination and exaltation of springtime, flowering the way to work. Begin to the pageant of queuing girls, the arrogant loneliness of swans in the canal. Bridges linking the past and future, old friends passing though with us still. Begin to the loneliness that cannot end, since it perhaps is what makes us begin. Begin to wonder at unknown faces, at crying birds in the sudden rain. At branches stark in the willing sunlight, at seagulls foraging for bread. At couples sharing a sunny secret, alone together, while making good. Though we live in a world that dreams of ending, that always seems about to give in, Something that will not acknowledge conclusion insists that we forever begin.
it's not the most straightforward poem but just to point out a couple of things in it the first and last word of the poem is begin which brings it full circle and then the idea of the poem is that even if we end up where we first began it's still time for us to begin again and the repetition of the word throughout the poem I think it's something like 10 times that's pointing to the fact that we must never give up we must try and try again to begin if you were born in the 90s <laughs> or maybe a bit later if you're born in the last 20 years you might even not even know what this is <laughs> Someone actually lives in here. That must be his house. <laughs> it's gorgeous, isn't it? You can see here they're unloading the boat for O'Sullivan's mill. There was a grain mill here in Bally Longford at one time, and there's a pier just outside town, a couple of kilometres outside town where they would have shipped the train and the, the grain and traded between like say Clare and Limerick and also there was a creamery here so all the farmers brought their milk to the creamery and this is a picture of <laughs> them bringing the milk to the creamery in 1939 This is Bridge Street in Bally Longford, presumably named after the bridge I'm standing on right now. And this is probably where the photograph on the notice board was taken, back there. Must have been a pub at one stage just here but now it's just a house with a Guinness sign on top of it. That's what all pubs are, public houses, somebody's house with drinks. And just here you have Finucane's bar, the O'Rahilly. So the room up above there is where Mr O'Rahilly, the O'Rahilly would have lived. This was built in the 1800s by Bannatyne grain merchants and it was then during the famine between 1845-1850 it was used as a soup kitchen to feed people who were starving. That was Baddy Longford in North Kerry. John O'Shea who I met this morning on his bicycle said that I have to come back here and go for a pint with him in Finucane's bar sometime. I would definitely take him up on that offer and definitely recommend a visit to this town. I think you'll agree for a town so small there is a huge amount of history and clearly the people here take such pride in their place where they live. You can see that in the way that everything's kept, it's tidy, there's plaques and memorials everywhere you look and the people like John this morning are talking about their history, keeping it alive.
see you later. <laughs> you can fool them into thinking we're friends, watch. Hey boys! Come here. Come here. Come here. Look. Look. See? Yeah, see? Now we're friends. See? Now, we're great friends now. <laughs> friend of mine. Yeah. See? <laughs> There's been some rain. Look at this, the waterfall in Inish Diamond. That's magnificent, isn't it? Well now, that was really something. You'd barely know what was there standing on the main street up here. But it is, come down this arch. Beautiful. And one of the reasons I say this is, in my opinion, one of the most attractive towns in Ireland is the shop fronts all along the main street. It's very tidy here, but very, very colorful. I am a sailor and you're my first mate We signed on together, we coupled our fate When we started the voyage, it was just me and you Now gather around us, we have our own crew Life is an ocean, love is a boat in troubled water, it keeps us afloat When we started the voyage, it was just me and you Now gather around us, we have our own crew
weather is glorious today. Glorious weather. Connemara, of course, is known for having very wild and scenic landscapes like the one before me now. This is called the Green Bee, someone's house. They do jam, honey, vinegar, soap, you name it. And actually the lady just stepped out of the house here and she said that her grandfather saw me walking on the road last night and she asked if I want to come in for a cup of tea. <laughs> I would have taken that offer up any other day, except for today. I have a big distance to cover and I want to cover it all, but most of it this morning so that I can uh, let the hair down. But that's just lovely to experience that kind of thing, that kind of hospitality. I think when you spend enough time in the big towns or the big cities you can forget that this is what it's really like in other parts of the world, other parts of the country. Like everyone around here would know each other I'd imagine and I suppose that creates a, nurtures a sense of safety, a safety which allows a young lady like the lady back there to invite me in for a cup of tea. This strange man walking along the road in winter. <laughs> well, almost winter. This is Kamas in Connemara. This is a Gaeltacht area, meaning that most of the locals around here, probably all of the locals, speak the Irish language, Gaelic, as their first language, everyday language. And there's a sign here that says, the Earl of Dudley bought Screeb Lodge for its fishing. And his wife, Lady Rachel Dudley, raised funds for district nurses in the west of Ireland. Um, being a le Lady Dudley nurse, it was a vocation, meaning that they had to work a seven day week and they would walk across the bog and the mountain for miles to deliver babies. Lady Dudley drowned near this spot in 1920, but her nurses continued to do the rounds until 1974. I imagine this is what visitors to Ireland really want to see. These very old traditional houses on very unspoiled landscapes. Far from all the visitor centres and paid attractions, you might say. Real Ireland. When I arrived at the guest house last night, Marion said to me, Are you crazy? Out walking in this weather? And I said, No, I'm healthy and I'm good for the environment. <laughs> Honestly, all the cars whizzing past me today, half of them are tourists by the look of the, the registration plates. They're all brand new cars, rental cars. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, they get to see it. 
but not the way I do. Killery Fjord is said to be, I think, the only fjord in Ireland. It's around 16 kilometers long and 50 meters deep at its deepest point. And it's beside the village of Lenon, which I think is best known for being the location for the movie The Field. This was a play written by John B. Keane and it was a story about a piece of land for which a generation had taken care of down through the years and when it came to owning this piece of land they came up against stiff competition when a wealthy American investor rolled into town and the pub here Gainer's pub was one of the filming locations for the bar in the movie as well as the waterfall just outside town and the last thing I want to say is that this walk was a blessing in many different ways. I was waking up most mornings thinking to myself, this is where I ought to be. And most importantly, I was finding my way again. I was on the move. I was looking at the world with curiosity, with a sense of wonder, with optimism. And I was remembering that the pot of gold is at the end of the rainbow, not at the beginning. A few weeks ago, when I was down in West Cork in Drimmer League, I was talking to a David Flanagan who was looking after me at the time. And at top of the rock, he said to me, Where are you going to finish the trip? And I said, I had planned on finishing on the Great Blasket Island. But I said, to be honest, thinking way ahead of myself, there is a chance that I will finish somewhere else. And I am very close to that somewhere else right now. I was not expecting this at all. As I came over the brow of the hill up there, I was met with this absolutely stunning landscape. Wide open landscape. A mixture of green fields, dark green forest, and then the whiskey brown colored peat bog, which rolls all the way up onto the hillside here. Alright, the forecast for today.
I'm crossing the bog now. It's very wet. It's gonna get wet today. Feet are gonna be wet very soon. There's nothing I can do about that. And at this point, my instincts have taken over. I'm just paying attention to the present moment, not what's ahead, the present moment. And I'm asking myself, are you okay? And if I'm okay, keep going. This is not the time to be feeling afraid, in other words. This is the time to be alert. Some hail, hailstones there for sure. I can feel them on my legs. This is much tougher now going up the boggy hill. Very, very wet. Okay, let's go. Anytime it dies down just a little bit when it's like that, I take that opportunity to get moving. And you can see now how slow it is going up here compared to walking on the road. Crow Patrick is known as the Holy Mountain in Ireland. The top of Crow Patrick has been a site of worship for more than 3,000 years. And this is because our ancestors knew of the potency of this as a sacred site. Even 600 AD, people were coming up here to worship the sun god, Lug. And then in more recent times, still a long, long time ago, St. Patrick was said to have fasted on top of the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Just crouch down here as let, let some of the rain sweeping over the mountain go past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>